Welcome to our coronation special. Coronation special on Prince Charles's face. This is the face that's going to be going on all our money, the the notes and the coins. It is the face of our figurehead. You know, figurehead's face with, with that, and uh, I guess in a large part is our figurehead. And I think one of the large things that I have brought to the, the internet to public knowledge is the fact that faces aren't always set. There's this big environmental flexibility in facial form. We'll, we call this craniofacial dystrophy. So here's an um, illustration of how faces can change. It's this animation, how faces can move from what I would refer to as an idealized, a really good facial form to a, a, a greatly downswung facial form. There, there are variations in how this happens. But I think that most people are not aware of how much influence their environment, their lifestyle they have, can have on facial development. And people don't want to believe that in many ways. They want to believe that the way their face has grown is largely de genetically determined. You know, their face, that is them, their ID, the image looks back from a mirror at them. Now, however, look at someone who has a stroke, and here's an illustration of someone who has a stroke, and just, you know, here you can see one side of the face has dropped down, and this happens repeatedly, you know, it will always happen if you have a stroke to some degree. It can happen to really quite a large degree, and it, um, it's, you know, it's clearly from a change in the muscle usage. And remember, this is just the surface muscles. You know, I've seen people who have had strokes with these puppies in the, the big power muscles. And that's a very different type of event. I haven't got the images. I'd love one. But that's far more profound. And it's really dramatic. And it's really quite rapid, the effect of those strokes. So we know, point blank, the environment can have a big influence on your face. So let's look at Charles. Here's um, some images of Charles when he's a young boy. And, you know, from the middle image, you see he's got really good facial form and cracking facial form. But I notice in the other two images, his lips are apart. Okay, one is smiling, the other clearly is not smiling, but lips are apart. Now, there we go. I think that's a, that's a classic sign, you know, lip seal is an important um, thing in determining facial outcome. And of course, Key is a portrait. I mean, uh, Prince Charles, he knows he's the monarch's son. He knows he's the heir apparent. They're taking a photograph. This is, I would imagine, a, a formalized uh, setting. They're taking a portrait. Either he knows intrinsically that he looks better with his lips together, or someone's taken one of many photographs where his lips are together. But when I look closely at these lips, I have the impression that he's making some effort to keep those lips together. And it's not a natural lip seal. He's making some effort to achieve this. And then if we go on to the next slide here, I think roughly at the same time period, we've got multiple images, and if we look a little bit closer at those multiple images, you can see, you know, particularly on the one on the left here, you can see how the light's just catching that um, lower belly of the abicularis oris, you know, that muscle in the lower lip is too large. Well, it's too large. What do I mean by too large? In someone who has ideal lip posture, I believe, because they have ideal function, they will have ideal form. You know, this form and function duality. And he's not functioning correctly. He's having to use his mentalis muscle here and the lower lip, the lower belly of orbicularis oris to maintain the lip seal. So that's the correct, incorrect function. Then you have incorrect form. Now you've got the shadow. The lights cut, caught that beautifully with that shadowing just along here. Then in the middle photograph, you can see that shadowing just here because I think that what he's also doing, he's also recruiting his buccinators. So cherubs and babies should have an infantile swallow pattern and large cheeks. Adults, should have an adult swallowing pattern and their cheeks should hollow out from atrophy, from 
it, um, non-usage. And I think that rarely happens today. My estimate is around 85% of people continue to use their buccinators, these cheeks. So they have large cheeks. And of course, in the right hand picture, it just looks a little bit frumpier. It doesn't look quite right, does it? You know, so now roll on a little bit. A few years later, what we can see is this length of Prince Charles's face is getting longer. And we know that teeth that are touching tend to over erupt and so if you've got your mouth open the back teeth and the bottom all of the teeth are going to over erupt further which is going to increase facial height and for one reason or another we're seeing this clear and obviously in this lower facial third here it is clearly increased that's much more than ideal I would I think that if he kept his lips together and he'd been eating tough food that would have been reduced you can also see on the, the side image here of the highlighted bit I've put in you can see the shadowing that he's got a big buccinator so he's clearly using that muscle because as we know the more you use muscles the bigger they get and ideally that muscle would have been atrophied so we should have hollow cheeks look at people on the African Serengeti these, or anywhere living indigenous lives they tend to to have hollow cheeks okay people with good facial structure tend to have hollow cheeks so now let's wind forward a bit you clearly we're in our sort of university era as a young man and what we can see here is um the left hand image on this i mean i think we could this is when he's playing polo i think i can spot a saddle and a back of a horse in the um, background he's got he's probably just come off the horse he, he, he's, he's worked out he doesn't know someone's taking a photograph and lips are open i think this is an illustration of charles's natural lip posture at this age they're open mouth hanging down yeah mouth hanging down all the time it's a little bit reminiscent of that guy who said the stroke lost special tension face is lengthening but this is bilateral it's both sides it's symmetric in the middle photograph he's making an effort to keep his lips together and kind of smiling you know um and of course again you've got those more of those those lines around the side because where those the, the enlarged buccinators are meeting the action in the front here and on the picture on the right you know Vince Charles is pensive I think he's at an important meeting here and you can see now that great big sausage like muscle you know great big muscle that whole roll because you know you're using the mentalis which is going to roll that lip as well and you've got a lot of muscle in that lip and of course you can see that muscle there plain and obvious now one thing prince charles reminds me of is an adenoidal face now the word adenoidal face it attributes cause we think adenoidal faces are caused by enlarged adenoids i don't know if charles had enlarged adenoids but it, it's all about mouth breathing stuffy noses these types of things the classic signs of someone with a adenoidal face is having the high arch palate and you know given that increase with the whole face has got long so i talked about the lower facial third but certainly in the mid facial third um it, it, and if you've got an increased middle fa facial third you're likely to have a high arch palate a relatively narrow dental arching you can see that from his relatively narrow smile you're going to get this short upper lip and what seems to happen is as the lower facial third increases the it becomes further for the lips to go to maintain a lip seal so it gets harder and because you're not maintaining a lip seal then the top lip will stops doing anything so the top lip gets even shorter now that makes it more more hard to maintain a lip seal so this is a vicious cycle in many ways and of course this is associated with underdeveloped upper and lower jaws i think it's a little bit more complex i don't think the length of these jaws is any length longer i think it's just that it's angled downwards so i look like i've got a smaller jaw now it's no shorter i've just angled it downwards so the horizontal component that we associate with as the jaw is smaller because it's angled differently now it's also associated with facial lengthening because we have discussed that mouth breathing we've discussed adenoidal face blocked nose inability to breathe out your nose you become become a mouth breather now i don't actually think that where the air goes is that important but if your tongue's hanging open and your mouth a lips are separated and your teeth are apart your face is going to lengthen i like the stroke we looked at earlier on but one in, another interesting thing is these prominent ears now prince charles 
seems to have had pro relatively prominent ears even from a very young age. However, they do seem to have got worse. Now, when you look at the sort of concept of cranial osteopathy or craniosacral therapy, interesting, two professions have come to very similar conclusions from very different angles. I know they're not rated highly as very scientific. It would be difficult for them to be such. However, when you look at how an adenoidal face would have morphed, you would expect the temporal bone to do an action like that. And of course, that would move the ears out as if, you know, you've got mountains on a tectonic plate that have moved. And this is one of the acute signs of the movement that's happened. And, you know, it, it is, it, it's striking the similarities between Charles's face at this age and an adenoidal face. So, and I think that kind of attributes some sort of potential blame, some sort of environmental insult on his face. Now, What's really interesting is that the Princess Royal, Prince Anne, Charles's younger sister, a couple of two, three years younger, um, developed really well to begin with, and then started to leave her lips open. So much so that my father wrote to the Queen in 1962 to say he was concerned that, you know, she, she hadn't got good lips ill and she was likely to develop malocclusion. And when we look back at Princess Anne in this left-hand photograph, you can see the gaps between the front teeth, a little bit like Charles had in that first image I showed you in the middle, um, where he had some gaps between the front teeth. Now, Princess Anne clearly had some spaces, so she was going in a reasonable direction, but you can see from that middle image, things are going wrong. You can see those front teeth right the way down, face less appealing, again, this emotive subject. And I think Dad's uh, concerns seem to be founded. And she has also developed a longer face. I don't think as acute as Prince Charles, but clearly a longer face. And here's a slide my father uses to illustrate the point. Um, I'm sorry, it is a little bit mean on Prince Anne. I, I think she does really, really great work. She's, you know, another person just trying to help the nation as hard as she can to all her abilities. And in a way, Prince Anne, I'm sorry you're also helping me illustrate a point here, as is your brother. Um, now, this the, the type of change in Princess Anne is often heralded, voiced as a the type of damage that extractions can cause to faces. And yet, the Queen didn't want extractions, and they used a functional appliance, apparently, for Princess Anne. I think my father did know who treated her. Now, functional appliances, to, to put a plastic of wire in the mouth... You know, you can use them as a guide and keep your mouth closed yourself, in which case they would have the most wonderful results. And if that's the only cases you saw with functional appliances, you would think they were the best thing ever. Or, with all that extra stuff in your mouth, you can hang your mouth open like this. And you can have a terrible result. I often wonder if functional appliances do this rather than doing this. And on average, they don't seem to have a great response. But I think, again, a lot's lost when you average it. Because some people clearly get fantastic outcomes. And some people would appear to get terrible outcomes. And once you've averaged it, well, maybe you've lost something in your averaging. Anyway, so let's have a look. What if Prince Charles had gained lip seal? So I'm not talking about from a really early age. Because I think if you were at a really early age, you could have had really stunning changes. I'm, I'm not going to say Prince Charles would have looked like Brad Pitt. You know, it would have been fascinating had we got a figurehead that looked like Brad Pitt. You know, what are the implications? Would we look at the monarchy differently? I, I, I don't know. You know, interesting question though. You know, however, what we do know is that facial form is malleable, far more malleable than people would like to think. So here we have Prince Charles and you can see this um, change that's going on. Well, you know, a good section of the face is changing and it is having quite a remarkable effect on facial form and how you read this face, you how you emotionally look at this face. Clearly, I'm looking at it from a health perspective, but <clears throat> without the knowledge of what health impacts these are, you're likely to look at this on an emotional perspective. And <clears throat> this is the type of change, I think, that 
from sort of 10 years old, if you'd gained a lips hill, with, uh, most of you already know, most growth has happened in both boys and girls by 10 years old. And that's the sort of change I think you can get by gaining lips hill. It's, 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 it's amazing, you know. Um, Charles was married to, Prince Charles was married to Princess Diana, all right? Two people who had a relationship. The relationship didn't seem to end well. And I, I question actually whether it even started well. Now, I remember sitting beside a right royal, you know, uh, an imperial battle axe of a woman at a wedding. And it was actually quite nice, but, you know, she had some fairly certain views. And her certain view was that um, Princess Diana was, uh, was loved. She was wonderful. And that mean old Prince Charles was terrible. And I'm thinking, well, how do you know that Princess Diana was wonderful? You know, you, you, you've never met her. And you would need to spend really some time with someone to actually know what they're like. It seemed to me that Princess Diana, because she was really pretty, sassy, attractive and fashionable, seemed to get a slightly easier ride than Prince Charles, who was a little bit formal, a bit stuffy, a bit, spoke a bit strange, his ears stick out and he had a long face and wasn't so attractive. And... I think that kind of held him back, and I don't think a fair judgment was made. And so, in, in some ways, looks do matter. I, I think we would be slightly hypocritical to suggest that looks don't matter, and you don't make a judgment on someone based upon how they appear. So, yeah, I, I think there are, it, it, there is an issue here. Um, now, okay, so is there a change occurring now? All right, so. We've got three photographs from Charles at different periods in his life. We've got the, that image I showed you earlier on. I've swapped, reversed that now to make them all line up. Uh, that Charles at university, as we showed earlier on. Now, between, we know, between the first and second image, he deteriorated. And, I you know, from what I've read of his time in Gordonston, his relationship with his slightly strict father... You know, and also, you know, becoming a monarch or this, this knowledge you're going to become what's expected of you. I, I, I got the impression he had a bit of a rough time, okay? I don't think it was a bed of roses for him. And I, I think, you know, he... Yes, I, you know, and I think he then changed... I get the impression, let's say, has put forward the hypothesis that he then changed his attitude. And you, you think of the terminology. So let's say he... um got on with life, stood up straight, shut his mouth, he gritted his teeth, he, um, you know, all this phraseology, you know, to describe how you get on in life. And that's what I think Charles did. And I think he really made an effort because now he's realising, yeah, he's maturing, um, he's got to get out there. Being king one day is inevitable. You know, being a leader, people looking up to you, and he's got to accept that place in life. And I think that, you know, any photographer photographer could jump out of a bush at any point, take a photograph. You've got to keep your lips together. You intrinsically know that that is better. It looks better. And that's intrinsically what I think he started to do. So, and that was my hunch, okay, because I've seen that before. So I wanted to analyse this hunch. So I went and got some photographs. And here's two, the two photographs I found. They're not perfect profiles, but... I think they're both imperfect in roughly the same way. So you've got, um, they're, they're both slightly towards the camera so that you can see a little bit of the further eyebrow. Now I have the, the, the image to the left are flipped. So we're looking, we're comparing the left and right side of the face. So it's not going to be perfect to start with, but what, but this is all I had. So. I'm going to make the best analysation of Charles's face that I can. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a system called an MFO. So I've laid these two photographs over the top of each other. And I've tried to make them the same size. And here's an illustration. Uh, I've, I've drawn a line along his forehead and down his nose. So if we follow that through. And then when you toggle backwards and forwards between these photographs, I think you can see I've got that forehead more or less correct. I mean, I can see those ears moving. Well, clearly, up it could be left ear, right ear. I, I don't know what Charles's symmetry is like. And um, maybe these aren't that good, you know, images to compare. You know, I'm doing what I can. 
So what I also just wanted to check is how if, if, if the forward position of the nose, and I think it's slightly off, but I think it's slightly off by about the thickness of the line that I've drawn though. So they're, they're pretty close. And then I just compared facial thirds. So I've looked at that middle facial third and seen the well, This is the same. It was more or less the same on those facial thirds. So taken that given that I've done my best to get two images that overlay, what, what do I think about the changes here? So I've marked up where um, Charles's chin point is at this point, And then I have marked the chin point when he's older. Clearly he's got more chins when he's older. That happens. Given how relatively accurate we are here, we seem to have quite a lot of change in his chin point. The term we would use, if I was to be scientific about this, would be this was statistically significant. Given the amount of variation in the, the base data, the change in the factor that I'm looking at seems relatively large. Okay, okay this is armchair science. I'm not trying to say, I'm not going to write a thesis on this. But it would seem, as I flick backwards and forwards between these images, that Charles has upswung. So his whole face has moved up and forwards. He's been aiming to keep his lips together, and he's been working hard on that. And that's the sort of change, type of change I predicted would happen, and the kind of change that I'm now seeing that appears to be happening. Okay? Then I measure the facial thirds. And so this is, again, you know, just looking at a different angle. Maybe this is going to be a little bit more accurate because however much rotation you get here, um, it's a relative measurement. And we seem to have gone from what 1.4 to 1.6. So clearly we seem to have get, I, I would imagine this seems to be statistically significant. And you can see there, on the left photograph, how, uh, let's take all those lines away, e e the, the lip seal seems less natural on the left than it does on the right, and it would appear that that muscle in the lower lip has got a little bit smaller because it's having to do less work, okay? Because the lips are together more, and maybe it's that because the facial third has decreased, it's easier now for him to keep his lips together. So now he's gained a virtuous cycle of change. Now, Charles, well done. I'm really impressed with that. Unfortunately, as I say, everything starts going south in time. So I don't know we'll see continuing incremental levels of change. Um, but I, I, Charles, well done. I'm, it's really impressive. And I've, I'm, I'm a royalist. I would like to wish everyone a happy coronation and long live the king. I, I've been really impressed with Charles. You know, yes, his ears stick out. Yes, he doesn't look as attractive. And he speaks a bit funny, although I think he's got better with that as well. However, look at the actions of what he's done. Yes, he didn't gain any sympathy from the Diana saga, but really he, he, he's been with one woman all the time. That was a woman he always loved. Yes, yeah, so she's not everyone's cup of tea, but hey, who is? Um, Charles, we, we're talking actions. He was in the Green Movement just, you know, decades and decades before anyone else. He was in the Green Movement where people were laughing at him for what he was doing. All the old petrol heads were just literally, it was laughed at. People made fun of him. They are not making fun of him anymore. He is a thought leader by anyone's imagination or definition and um, also then he's, he's multi-dimensional it's not just that he's also um i'm really impressed with how he's you know he's deeply concerned about the architecture of our cities and beautification you know again this is the environment we live in buildings last why not try to make buildings more attractive try why not try to make the environment which we all live in more aesthetic. Not only do we want to make faces more aesthetic, that would be great. We want to make our surroundings more aesthetic. And I really support anyone who's just questioning people. You know, we don't want these edifices that are some um, brutal uh, mark to someone's ego. And he, he's, he's, you know, I, I would agree with him that we need to be thinking about this. And finally, um, the Prince's Trust. If you don't know about the Princess Trust, I think this is the best charity ever. I don't know if it becomes the King's Trust. Now, I don't know. But the idea is if you can take a child who is going to be a taker their entire life 
from society and you can convert them to be a giver for their entire life from society. Well, you know, I'm a, actually, what more can you do on a society level for society? And that's what the Princess Trust does. And having Charles as patronage, I mean, it, it, it's got his name. It was his idea. That's a great charity. I think that beats any other charity I know of. If you're going to uh, support a charity, support the Princess Trust. I highly recommend that. And um, Charles, also, you know, you you are um, setting a good example. You're setting a good example in all of these things. And of course, you've also improved your facial form. That is setting a fantastic example to everyone out there. That's really helping your health. I still worry that you may have sleep apnea. And I would worry about what options you may choose to correct that sleep apnea because I worry many of them can make the situation worse. I, you know, if you want advice, it, my king, I'm all here to help. Um, and the next thing is your grandson because he's at the age where... I think, you know, he's just leaving that age where simple things like stand up, stretch, shut your mouth, eat with your mouth shut, chew some tough food, chew some gum. These things, look at my five point prevention plan that will be linked below, because these are the type of things can really make a difference. And I do think my personal opinion is that the face of the figurehead of our nation counts. It's important. And if I can do anything to improve the face of our future king, I'm there. I'm here to help. I want a better response than my father got in 1962. All right, listen. Thank you very much. All the best. Happy coronation weekend. And long live the king.